And now we'll explore Actually. how Microsoft is applying machine learning to cancer care. So please welcome to the stage Antonio Criminisi. He's a principal researcher at Microsoft working on artificial intelligence, medical image analysis, and more. And Steve Clemens is leading the conversation again. Steve. Just move chairs so they give you a different perspective. Antonio, how are you? Good, thank you. So uh, you are one of the great uh, experts. Now, you're, you're, you're not based here, right? You're based in London? No, I'm based in Cambridge. Cambridge. The, the other one, the, the old Cambridge. The, oh, the, yeah, the, the, the one near London. So yeah, the one near you London. could give me credit for the country. <laughs> um, so over there, I mean, I, I was fascinated when I was reading a bit about your work and, and how you're trying to use machine learning and AI uh, to basically help arm um, you know, doctors and those that are, that are treating. So, so what was the breakthrough that you helped participate in to be a game changer for those dealing with uh, cancer treatments? Yeah, thank you for the question. So um, I'm leading Project InnerEye within Microsoft. Um, it is a... So a I'm gonna just say that AI, right? Yeah. Project InnerEye. Inter inner inner eye. eye. okay. Inner eye. And it you uses have a wonderful accent. You could be from uh, Oklahoma. It's between Italian and English, so it's very yeah. confusing. <laughs> I apologize for so that. So no, I just want to make sure they got it. So inner eye. Inner eye, Project Inner Eye. It is about using machine learning technology for the automatic analysis of medical images. So we're talking about uh, tomographic images like CT scans, MR scans, completely standard you know, imaging techniques as they are acquired in, in Seattle and every other hospital around the world. Now, the problem they were trying to solve is that um, for the most uh, part, these images are acquired, they are looked at by radiologists or other physicians, and quite quickly they get discarded. So you can see an example there. That's a magnetic resonance image of a, a tumor, that's a glioblastoma tumor. And what we do with those images, rather than just um, allow the doctors to eyeball them and say, Yes, there is cancer, but I wouldn't really be able to say how, how big it is or how fast it's growing compared to the previous visits. We try to quantify the lesion. We try to really turn medical images into quantitative you know, measuring devices. That, that's the key uh, goal of our project. And we do that through machine learning technology that runs on the Microsoft Azure cloud uh, with our algorithms where the algorithms do the segmentation, i.e. the delineation of regions of interest in 3D. Here, here? here we're looking at another case. This is a case of a, a pelvic you know, CT scan, and this is for a patient, a male patient of a certain age who has been diagnosed with prostate cancer. So this case is particularly interesting because um, one of the potentially three or four different ways of treating cancer is using is by using radiotherapy or radiation therapy. And that means you know, uh, putting the patient inside a machine which delivers you know, energy in the form of you know, X-ray photons or protons or other uh, similar technology. And you need to give instructions to the machine on exactly what area of the body you need to target. In this case, it would be the prostate or the seminal vesicles. That's where the, the, the cancer is. At the same time, the machine needs to avoid areas that are healthy, that call organs at risk. And so in order to give these instructions to the machine, a radiation oncologist or a dosimetrist need to sit in front of the computer and do tons and tons of clicking on the computer, drawing, drawing lines. And this is a, a very uh, time-consuming and error-prone exercise. So if we can use machine learning to do that job for them or together with them, then we can save these people a lot of time. And potentially, potentially we can also make that progress, uh, process um, easier to digest and less error prone, like more accurate, for sure more repeatable. It is well known that the same expert, a radiation oncologist with many, many years of experience, you know, doing the uh, delineation of the same tumor on the same image, on the same patient, done twice, perhaps on a Friday and then on a Monday, the intersection between those volumes, which in theory should be 100%, in average is only about 80%. So there is 20% variability, which is just inaccuracy. So we would like to remove that. So in, in, in a case like this, when you're doing this, how, I mean, this looks to me, and I'm not able to judge it, but maybe you can give us some context. Is this 
state of the art, the very highest uh, end of what you've achieved? So this is a new innovation, or has this begun to be dispersed through the system so that, you know, if we have um, uh, folks with cancer here in the audience, that it's going to be uh, available within within uh, treatment centers here? Well, both things. So this is state of the art in the sense that it's, you know the very latest research that we've been working on. You know, for about 10 years, you know, the project started in 2008, but in the past three years or so, we've been uh, able to make really uh, quick progress. And the way in which the project itself has been transformed is to go more towards, you know, the clinical study sort of setting. So it's not just research in the sense of writing papers, going to conferences, which of course we still do, uh, but you know, we're working with the University of Washington Medical Center in here together with 25 or so other hospitals around the globe where we're starting to trial um, this computer system. Does it work? Does it not work? Because in the end, you know, there is uh, many, many papers out there which write about you know, how you know, we are clever and our algorithm is good and we achieve 90 or 95 percent accuracy. The real accuracy that we care about is, does it actually work in the clinical setting or not? Does it do something for the you know, physicians who are using it or not? In particular, our goal- And does it work or does it not? It is starting to. Yeah, it so is starting to. That's right, so we have- Can I afford it? Oh, actually, you know, one of the main goals of this research is not just to achieve great accuracy, and it's not to make money, really. It is to have an impact on society while at the same time reducing costs, reducing the cost of treatment. So you will be able to afford this system better than the standard of care that you, know, you do today. You know, here's a, a practical example. So right now, in the case of head and neck cancer, a radiation oncologist might take in the order of you know, two hours, together with the help of dosimetries, perhaps, to do all the planning. You know, it is particularly difficult to do the you know, manual segmentation of the various of organs at risk and potential growth that you have in, in the throat area. This is just because you know, CT scans are notoriously not very good at capturing contrast you know, in this area. Everything, let's be honest, looks gray. And so <laughs> unless you're an absolute expert, it's very difficult to figure out where certain glands you know, start and, you know, and end. So it's a very laborious a process, which means that those highly paid individuals have to spend many, many hours of their daily uh, time to just do this very tedious work. Now, if we can do that work in five minutes instead, you know, that is a lot of time that is saved and obviously also a lot of money. And part of that time can be used by those doctors in a much better way to take care of their actual patient or maybe to understand more about the intricacy of that specific tumor and rather than treating as the average you know, head and neck cancer they will have more time to understand exactly more specifically how to treat this particular type of tumor this is this is fascinating let me ask you a similar question as I ask our earlier uh, guests how would you critique the rest of the ecosystem so you've created this innovation they talked a lot about you know patient centric, um, therapies and, and, and building models that, that do this, which I, I find compelling, but yet there's another dimension here, which is just pure science and getting the science right. Absolutely. This is the classic precision medicine mm -hmm. uh, approach. I, I'd love to see what you think is not working in the cancer ecosystem that if it were doing better would help you achieve these kinds of applications. Well. There are lots of inefficiencies in any healthcare system, not only in the US, but in Europe where I come from and all over the world. And so what we're trying to do is you know, target those inefficiencies and try to improve on those. Now, I'm not here to criticize why. You know, I want you to system. criticize someone. I'm, I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't, I'm not the you know, yeah. best place to do that really. Um, but for sure, there are many inefficiencies. Now here, we are talking about one of them. And what we're trying to do is not only develop the science, uh, but also understand really deeply you know, what doesn't work in the current clinical workflows. So in my team, we have uh, also radiation oncologists, for instance, and we collaborate, like I said earlier, with you know, more than 20 different hospitals around the globe, and you know, that network is growing, where we're really trying to understand what are the pain points and what are the things that don't work. Not just in the United States. Not Payment just systems. 
again, that is something that I'm not best place to solve. <laughs> but from a, you know, a processing point of view, from a, a, a clinical workflow point of view, what are the pain points? So for instance, another one that is uh, well known is the fact that um, monitoring cancer patients is a very difficult and very expensive job. So here we're talking about uh, patients who have been diagnosed with perhaps a not so aggressive type of cancer. It could be a, a glioma grade one, for instance, in the brain. So quite often, you know, the best course of treatment is not to do anything, but to just monitor the progression of the uh, glioma cancer. And until the day when there is a, a clinical change and then you need to intervene and then you decide what to do with it. But the, the, the step of, you know, the process of monitoring the patient is itself very expensive, both on the healthcare system, but also on the patient who needs to go to hospital, you know, repeatedly, I don't know, every three months or so. A new image needs to be acquired, the radiologist needs to sit and needs to figure out uh, whether the lesion has grown or has shrunk and, and needs to write a radiological report. And in that report, they need to assess what is happening to the tumor. Now, mo most of them they're not. They need to figure out, okay, is it growing or is it not? And the tools that radiologists have at their disposal are very primitive. You know, most often, you know, they have just um, uh, the ability to draw a single line. You know, click on two points and draw a line and say, this is two centimeters, and uh, two weeks ago it was, you know, 2.1 centimeters, so something is happening. But clearly this is suboptimal because a tumor, just like our body is in 3D and drawing a single line doesn't capture the whole, the true evolution of the tumor. So these are the sort of things that we're trying to solve. Wouldn't it be great if we equipped radiologists and oncologists and perhaps surgeons as well, we're working with all of them, to say in volumetric form, you know, this is the evolution of the tumor and we can plot exactly how the tumor is evolving in terms of you know, volume in cubic centimeters or whatever, uh, but also track perhaps the edema, the inflammation around the tumor where we know that perhaps some tumoral cells have already spread and so that will give us an indication of what's happening, you know, what will happen in the future even after we remove uh, the main tumor. So really turning medical images into measuring devices, that's our goal. On top of that, then you can build all sorts of other uh, exciting signs, like what happens if we put together radiomics, which means you know, measurements extracted from radiological images, together with genomics. So that, in my opinion, would really hit you know, precision uh, medicine at its target. You know, genomics only probably doesn't do it. Radiomics only probably doesn't do it, but by starting to combine all these different disciplines together, might do it. Do you, let me ask you just a, a, a flat, what I would call a flat earth question uh, for a moment. Then I want to go to all of you and then we can go back to drinking. Um, the, I, I guess the question I want to ask really deals with your confidence in these big advances. So when you talk of radiomics, proteomics, proteomics uh, uh, you know, the, the, the advances in CRISPR, we just saw this case in China with uh, uh, embryos that were developed um, that were HIV, um, I guess, negative, if you will, or I don't know the actual correct term. But, but I, I'm interested in, because a lot of people worry about advances in science and what may happen, and you're sharing with them you know, the great gains that can come from this. Absolutely. What are the sort of speed rails or guardrails that we should be thinking about ethically? Bill Joy wrote a piece in 2001 about worries about you know, the power of computing and uh, nanotechnology and genetics research that could actually create accidents or, you know, put incredible power in the hands of, of, of bad folks. Right. Do, you, do you worry about those things yourself? I know you're a good guy, but do you worry about the bad guys? <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm a good guy or not, to be honest. <laughs> but yes, that, Those are your words, so. <laughs> absolutely, I, I do worry, and the whole team, you know, we always worry about the ethical implications of the work we're doing. Let me start by saying that, um, the press, most often than not, doesn't help really because you know right now there is a lot of hype around AI and a lot of uh, scare the Atlantic? Does the Atlantic help at uh, all? You, yeah. know, you guys are yeah, good guys. <laughs> so there is a lot of hype and a lot of you know miscommunication of what AI really is. Um, in many ways, you know, of course, we need to be uh, worried. We need to be careful about the technology that we're building, but it doesn't help to talk about. Um, 
diabolical robots that are going to replace us all or kill us all or who knows what, what's going to happen in the future. And in, indeed, nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. This dystopian view might materialize or it might not. But let's look at the value of what we are creating today. So quite often, I don't want to talk about AI precisely because of these you know, bad associations and connotations. And I prefer to be grounded on the term machine learning, where machine learning is just tools, practical tools. The way I see it is machine learning is the new software, just like you know, software you know, has enabled a lot of you know, different revolutions, including the internet, including um, office, and all sorts of other uh, tools that nowadays we give for granted. So will machine learning you know, is already doing. So in this case, for treatment of cancer, machine learning will enable you know, the use of new tools that will be put at the, you know, in the hands of clinicians and will make their job easier. It will not replace them. It will not you know, put them out of job, but it will for sure transform their job and my job and your jobs, in probably in a good way. But there are ethical implications as well of a different nature. For instance, um, at Microsoft, we are super, super sensitive about uh, data and privacy and you know, how sensitive this data is. And so, um, of course, you know, no machine learning can happen with it without data. But you know, when we work with uh, all the hospitals that we work with, you know, we are extremely rigorous in our processes in how we ingest the data, how we anonymize the data, how we seek consent from patients directly before we use the data and we explain the use of the data, and we participate into you know, patient meetings and meetings with patient um, advocacy groups. And you know, the first time I did that, I was you know, honestly very worried. So oh, who knows how the patients are gonna react to the fact that right. we want to use patients' data to help with our research project. And guess what? I still have to find one single advocate or one single patient who says, no, you cannot do this. No, you cannot use my data. Mm. Everybody, of course, are very, very happy for us to use the data anonymized again, of course, you know, uh, handled in the most private and most rigorous and sensitive way you know, to further research in cancer treatment. You know, Eric Schmidt, um, the former executive chairman of Google, I know it's not your favorite company, um, has said that, yeah, you're, you're okay, I'm just joking, but, but um, it has said that that AI will become more trusted by the public because of its applications in health and encountering fraud. He says those will be the two pathways uh, that both ma both um, hit that that will do this. And so I sort of see sense that that's part of what you sense is happening. But I guess my question would be, and then I really will go to all of you is is uh, we've just seen. A researcher in China ignore those norms, ignore those rules, and I wonder in the long time the kind of methodology and frame that you bring if you have a competitor to what Microsoft is doing in health in China and they're not doing those things, are you at a disadvantage? Do they get an advantage? You know, we might be at a disadvantage in the short term, but what matters really is the medium to long term. So we don't care about you know winning in the short term and you know, cheating <laughs> or, or doing unethical things like other people, other companies might do. You know, what really matters to us is the trust. And as you know, Microsoft's you know, brand is based on the trust of our customers and our partners. So we really care deeply about you know, playing the long-term game, uh, game and having patients, customers, and partners wanting to choose Microsoft because of what we bring to the table in terms of trust. Thank you. This is a much cooler discussion than I thought it was going to be. Oh, thank uh, you. No, <laughs> joking. Uh, okay, let's go to here. Quick questions, comments from the audience? Right up here in the front? No, I can't, I can't see. You guys are all want to go back to the reception. Dan? No. <laughs> yes? Right here. Hi. Hi there. Greetings. Greetings. Um, uh, it's wonderful to see Microsoft um, blazing a trail down this path. And I was just wondering, just in short, if you were to, you know, uh, if you were to wish something as your end goal, as your mission, in this very complicated uh, topic of cancer and 
uncovering um, cures and uh, what, what would that be ultimately? I mean, what is your, ultimately your goal in the great work that you're doing? With inner eye or, or beyond that? Well, I would say, you know, as a technology company mm. that's got a niche focus in healthcare, specifically right. in cancer, which I think is pretty incredible. Overall, what what would you what would you hope for with your work? Great, that, thank you. That's a very good question. So, of course, you know, as a first step, we would love to see our technology adopted in every hospital in the world, and you know, producing value for the clinicians and eventually for the patients. Um, but again, that's a short-term goal. My dream and my hope is that through technology, we will be able to actually uh, change and improve clinical practice at a much deeper level. Not just being able to, say, speed up you know, a radiologist's workflow or improve their workflow in terms of accuracy, but actually transform clinical practice. And let me give you an example. So when we talk about uh, prostate cancer, um, there are certain very well-known international guidelines for how to prepare the patient before taking a CT scan, which then gets used for the planning of the radiotherapy. Now, these are international guidelines, they are accepted, yet every country in the world does things slightly differently. So as an example, in North America and Canada, um, everything is a little bit more interventionalist, and so uh, the oncologist, or the surgeon in this case, you know, would implant some fiducial, uh, they call gold seeds or fiducials, within the prostate to be able to you know, better identify in the CT scan where the prostate is, and you can use gel and other spacing and all, all sorts of things which are right. implanted surgically. That obviously has got a cost, uh, but more importantly, there is a, a risk of infection which is carried by the procedure itself. Now, in Europe, where, I don't know, maybe we're poorer or we don't care as much, you know, that procedure is not done. The preparation is done in a very different way, and definitely, in most cases, there is no surgical implantation of anything. Now, it turns out the algorithms, you know, being trained on images coming from all over the world, is learning to work either the, with, you know, fiducials in uh, spacing gels or without. And so the people that we're working with in North America, now they're figuring out that, hey, wait a minute, if the algorithm can figure out where the prostate is and where the organs at risk are without this you know, procedure, then why do we do this? So we can save costs, we can avoid the risk of infection. So that's really my dream, where the technology that has got a relatively short-term goal actually might have really long-term implications from a clinical protocol, medical protocol point of view. Antonio, just before we close out, um, I assume you go to a lot of cancer conferences and you go to, and, sure. and, and you also share what you're doing with us. Can, is there anything you see out there that may not be even a, a Microsoft thing or could be in Microsoft, but uh, a technology, something along these lines, a therapy or development that may not be in sort of our, you know, uh, common uh, discussion right now that would be interesting that you think looks very promising, the sort of over the horizon possibilities that you're exposed to, but this audience might not know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, let's start with saying that there are now hundreds of startups and you know, small and big companies who are interested in applying AI or machine learning to various different sectors within the healthcare domain. Um, the one thing that is still perhaps under investigated is indeed, you know, the I was talking to someone else earlier on, the area of radio genomics, which again bring, means bringing together um, different information, measurable information from uh, radiological images, from genomics, from other omics type of uh, approaches. And through the use of all this information, being able to say, for this patient that I got in front of me, based on all this information, which is in many ways complementary and orthogonal to each other, this is the best treatment. So that, to me, would be real precision medicine. I see you know, some effort being done there. It's tough, it's really hard, especially in terms of collecting this sort of data, it's multidimensional. This data uh, tends to be um, living in different silo silos within hospitals and so difficult to get to and difficult to unify. But that would be the, the best effort, in, in my opinion, to, to go after. Do you think we'll ever really beat cancer? 
I believe we will be able to turn cancer into a, a chronic but manageable disease. And so we will probably die with cancer, then die of cancer. I think that's a good place to end. Antonio Cremonisi, thank, thank you very, very much. Thank Great you very discussion. Very much.